So let's talk about LEAD certification. Um, LEAD is an organization that developed, I'm thinking about 20, 25 years ago. I'm trying to remember exactly. I remember when it came around, I was still practicing design, actually. It was an industry. And it um, was a frustration for a lot of us who cared about sustainability and green design. And so what LEAD set out to do was to provide a standard for how you could tell whether or not you were meeting those sustainable and green uh, building practices and methods and materials in your designs um, from the beginning. And it started out small, but it grew and it gained popularity because most designers really want to make sure that our our work is not destructive to the environment. You know, our, our goal is to create sustainable and green habitats because it's not only better for the planet, it's better for the, the our clients who occupy them. And we'll talk a little bit about what this is and I'll show you how to learn more so that you can dive further in. Um, LEAD stands for uh, leadership. <laughs> And I'm terrible about knowing what acronyms are. I, I've been working for the government long enough now that I, I get the acronyms. I use the acronyms. I don't always know what they mean. Um, let's go. Let's go to click about. Um, know that, you know, lead is about healthy people and healthy places. And they believe that that is creates a healthy economy. And that includes things like wind, solar, um, yeah, here we go. Here's a little bit about where they began. Let's see. 1993. Okay, so it was even older than I thought. Um, and they they started with putting firms together um, to talk about how to create sustainable buildings. And you can see that, that they've got a very long history. And about 2003, that's when I thought they, they, they came along, but actually it's when it exploded. And that's when I became aware of them personally. Um, and for those of you guys who are learning about lead now, um, they've, they've come a long way and this is, this is, they are the preeminent, uh, resource. And there's a lot here for education. Um, you can subscribe, you can become lead certified yourself, which in your business will be something that you can advertise to your clients, especially clients that are looking for it. Um, and then there are certificates and badges that you can earn. There are even careers in green design. If this, if this class really gets you excited about sustainability, um, there's more you can do, a lot more you can do, and you can get a lot further into this and truly become certified in these different areas. And this will allow you to um, provide that additional uh, level of trust with your client. Certifications do that. You can become a member. And there's a lot here that they have um, resources, advocacy that you can be a part of if you're if you're interested. Um, so there's a lot here, okay? Um, I've downloaded some things I want us to look at as part of this uh, discussion that we're going to have about uh, lead and green building. Uh, this is a document that you can download called Introduction to Lead and Green, green Buildings. And let's see, I want to go down. Here we go. Let's zoom in here now. So you can see some of the environmental impacts of that buildings have on the environment, um, which is part of why we're talking about sustainability and why this was uh, something that I insisted on building into the curriculum. And rather than just be something that we talked about, and we will talk about in other classes, I thought it was important that you all study uh, sustainable design as a, as a course. And so you can see um, here that buildings account for 14% of potable water consumption. That is pretty significant, 14%. Um, 30% of waste output. This is just the buildings themselves, right? The resources needed to create them and operate them have a truly do have a significant effect on the environment. Uh, building design, 
takes in 40% of raw material use, is responsible for 38% of carbon dioxide emissions. So people worry about what car they drive, and they should. They worry about how long their showers are, and they should. But an individual's greatest impact on the environment isn't those things. It's other things. That actually includes um, food, uh, building, building use, how how their home, how efficient their home is. Um, 24 to 50% of energy use, 72% of electricity consumption. So there are ways that we can minimize every single one of those in our designs and allow our clients to, to, to operate more sustainably. Some things we need to take into consideration. Clearing, cl the clearing of land for development often destroys wildlife habitat. Extracting, manufacturing, and transporting materials may pollute water and air, release toxic chemicals, and emit greenhouse gases. I wish they made this a little easier to read. This is a little, this is not very high contrast. Okay, so clearing of land for development often destroys wildlife habitat. So let's talk about how can we, knowing in knowing that, what can we do on our projects personally to help reduce that? Well, we saw that in the last case study. They put their house in a field so they didn't have to cut down a single tree. They, um, there are things that you can do like take an existing site and instead of clearing, a, instead of our existing uh, home and renovate it or a historic restoration. So that way you're not you're not cutting down new land. You can also if you're going to if you have a piece of property and you need to remove trees, do it strategically. You know, that's one of the things I was taught when I was in school and I would like to pass along to you all. When you're looking at a site plan, say you have your client has a, a piece of property and you're going to site the house make it make it a consideration to not cut down any trees but if you have to cut down the pine trees cut down the softwood trees cut down the brush but then replace it elsewhere on the property plant more trees so offset what you're doing okay um, extracting manufacturing and transporting materials buy locally that's why you hear that a lot you know people talk about with produce for that you're when you're for your food to buy from local farmers markets. And I can say I lived in California for for a while and I loved the fact that I could do that. There were farmers markets. Well, we have farmers markets in in DeKalb County in particular. We have a very big farmers market. So when you when you can buy um, and source locally, you actually reduce transportation time. Building operations require large inputs of energy and water and generate substantial waste streams. Now, it's different for obviously commercial, large commercial building is going to do that more than a single house. But when you look at the fact that it it's not, there's not a single house that you're designing that's going to exist in isolation and that you have to think about the aggregate of all the houses, it begins to add up. So how can you how can you minimize dependence on the grid? A lot of people want to get off grid for many reasons, right? When look, think about what happens when the power goes out. I mean, <laughs> what happens if you are you have your own source of energy and it's sustainable, right? You get off grid. A lot of people want to live off grid. By learning about sustainable design practices, your client you can help your clients get off grid even if they live in the city. Okay, and then transportation to and from buildings by commuters. Um, you know, you might be able to help your clients design offices so that they can reduce their commute time. This is a big battle um, right now um, following the pandemic between people who want to commute and companies that don't. But by providing a more ergonomic, comfortable space for your um, clients in their own homes, you can actually increase their productivity. I worked for a company who did a lot of office work, office design, and they did a study. 
the company did a study and they showed ergonomics greatly increased the productivity of an employee and that it allowed them to work fewer hours, therefore having a better work-life balance, which was better for the, the company. But it also is better and healthier for society and people. With green um, building design, we can reduce environmental damage from all of this. It can even enhance the health of the environment and the people who use them. And green buildings tend to reduce energy usage. They tend to increase occupant satisfaction. They lower maintenance costs and they lower emissions of carbon dioxide, which is important to uh, our healthy climate. And so this goes into more, okay, so what is, let's just define it, because you know, I think it's important to do that. So we all are on the same page. Um, what is green building? So uh, sustainability and green often used interchangeably are about more than just reducing environmental impacts. Sustainability means creating places that are environmentally responsible, helpful, just, equitable, and profitable. Greening the built environment means looking holistically at natural, human, and economic systems and finding solutions that support quality of life for all. And that means not just human life. It's, it's, it's past time, and this course is going to address the elephant in the room. It's past time that we only looked at human life. We don't live on this planet in isolation. We share it with other life sources. And the more we care for those life's other life sources, the healthier the planet is. And so this resource is pretty terrific. And I'm, I just wanted to highlight some areas that I really thought were in need of being highlighted. I didn't, whoops, going the wrong direction here. I don't want to go through the whole thing. But I do want you to know that this is a, a very, this is a wonderful resource that you can all use in learning more about design beyond green. Initially, green buildings were intended to reduce damage to the environment. But as it was concept was applied to the built environment, it was clear that doing less damage is not enough. So now leaders in the field speak about regenerative, meaning those sustainable environments that interact with living systems and contribute to the long-term renewable uh, renewal of resources in life. What are we doing now? We're looking beyond sustainable. We're looking to do more than less harm. We're looking to go to the greater good. And so regenerative projects and communities involve stakeholders and require interactivity with those who occupy our spaces. You can be a leader in green design by designing projects that are sustainable and green and then submitting them for awards. I want to, I'm going to hopefully be able to share with you all um, separately of these lecture videos, a project that a uh, good friend of mine has done that is very green that has been submitted for some awards. I, uh, hoping that I can get him to talk about that for you, with you guys. If not, we'll find some other projects to um, look at because there's, there's more than at, more and out and more out there than ever. And so there are different types, right? So you're going to see that there is, there are different lead um, certifications and you're noticing building design and construction rather than architecture is being used. And that's because they want to be more inclusive and you know less limited to just architecture. And there's even lead um, certification for neighborhood development. Okay, and so there's more, and they have websites, and you can get a copy of this, and you can get a copy of other stuff on their from their main website. And I got that through resources. I believe, or education maybe. So there's a lot here. They have a lot and it's a little overwhelming, but I would say just start, just start looking at it and pick out stuff that sounds interesting to you and then go from there. Okay, we are gonna stop here and continue the next video.